Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're here. Um, I will bring in the panelists one by one. I'm going to start with Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos. Hello, Dr. Farsalinos. Hello. Thank you Hello, for joining everyone. us. Hi, thank you. Um, it was interesting that Jerry was basically talking about me, not only me, but that was the latest uh, story that he was uh, yeah. uh, commenting on. Yeah. I'm going to add um, Jenna in now. I'm going to add the rest of the panelists. Hi, Jenna. Oh. Welcome. Jenna, you know Constantinos. Constantinos, I think you know yeah, of Jenna. Course, of, course, of, course. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course, of course. All right. Um, we're going to add in Asa. Uh, Asa, you need to unmute yourself. Asa is currently driving out of Bangkok to go home before the lockdown. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Asa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm, I'm not. My son okay. is driving, so yeah, okay, I can talk. I have a, I have yeah. a nice story to tell you. Wait, let me have the last panelist. Yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. Okay. And this is Mirza Abir. Mirza, you need to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, done. Mirza, meet Dr. Farsalinos. Dr. Farsalinos, meet Mirza. Mirza is the consumer Hi. advocate for Pakistan. I, 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 I've never met him. He's probably the first consumer that I haven't met. Uh, yeah, active, <laughs> active consumer activist that I haven't met. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's new. He just joined Cafra. Um, okay, so. Great. Great. Um, okay. Only thing I'm going to ask everybody is if you aren't speaking, please mute yourselves so we can yeah. don't have any interference. Constantinos, why don't you start and tell us what you were yeah. where you were saying you were going to tell us when you first came so, on? So, um, uh, a few days ago on uh, July first, a, a U.S. pharma company announced the first results of um, use of a nicotinic cholinergic agonist in uh, SARS-CoV-2. They yeah. did uh, experiments in vitro in human cells and in monkeys. And they found that uh, a nasal spray of varenicline, which has the same properties as nicotine, mm -hmm. it acts, uh, it is a selective alpha-7 nicotinic cholinergic uh, receptor agonist um, substantially reduces within a few days the viral load of SARS-CoV-2 and they are moving to clinical trials. Uh, in their um, uh, preprint, they were uh, citing four of my studies, which were about the nicotinic cholinergic system, nicotine and so on. So we have the first in vitro and in vivo proof that our theory probably works our uh, our scientific hypothesis probably works so i'll be a bit patient uh, waiting for uh, um, clinical data but if there are any clinical data uh, bmj will be embarrassed yeah because well, you know um, uh, i don't know if you've seen my response in chaos uh, mm -hmm. Let me tell you that uh, I was never allowed to respond to the letter in the BMJ. And uh, so I, I've made more than 10 attempts. Yeah. I even sent, uh, my, besides, you know, submitting it online because they have a, a rapid response online system and it was always rejected. So I sent um, a response to the editor uh, herself. Um, the editor sent it to a, to a lawyer and the lawyer completely manipulated and changed my response. And they came back with a, with a modified text that they wanted to upload uh, under my name with me featured as an author. So you understand that this is, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what, what the hell they were thinking, but uh, you know, someone else wrote or modified, okay, let's say modified because it was a, a modification of my response. So someone else basically prepared the response and they wanted to upload it uh, under my name. So, for example, they removed the reference that, I, that I'm not paid by the University of Patras. <laughs> but that's the main argument that I have no conflict with the university. And, and you know what? The funny thing is that this is something that can be independently verified. You know, if well, you look, but listen, if you look at the website of the University of Patras, mm -hmm. you will not find my name anywhere. 
Yeah, because I mean, I'm and just, I'm just big stuff. Well, that's why I have uh, Jenna here because I wanted to ask Jenna something. And this, now that you've said that, I want to. Like, that, wait, listen, listen. If you want to know if someone is paid by a university, you just send an official letter in the mail, and yeah. you ask if this person is a member of a paid staff, whether he or she is paid by salary, by you know some kind of grants or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. it, it is something that whatever I would say they could independently verify that and yeah. they knew this since november 2020 so yeah. they had months to verify this yeah this is what my uh, question by the way by the way <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. come on it's a lot of information by the okay. way the bmj is a media partner of the investigative desk so there is another conflict of interest that they did not declare in the paper uh in the featured article and it's it's on their website on the, the website of the investigative desk lists the bmj as their media partner so this is another conflict which explains as you understand mm -hmm. why they are protecting them why they are protecting their uh financial conflict with bloomberg yeah and of course, why they are protecting all the nonsense that they say, basically they not only ignore the research which perfectly verifies us, but they also refer to the open safely study by presenting the wrong results. Because the open safely study found that smoking is associated with 11% less uh, risk of dying from COVID. But what they did was that they used the model which adjusted only for age and gender. Mm -hmm. While, you know, when you have a large list of uh, variables, uh, you know, that's, that's a preliminary model only. You have to use all adjustments in order to, pro to, to get some uh, credible results. And when the model was adjusted with, uh, when all the variables were included, mm -hmm. uh, the results were perfectly in line with, uh, with us basically they were you know far beyond our results because we never found in any study that smoking reduces the risk of dying from covid um uh, we we only found that uh very few smokers end up in hospital so that's very different you know uh, in yeah. fact we found that when you end up in hospital Probably these are the smokers who are most sensitive. Probably they have other kinds of diseases. But when you end up in hospital, then uh, it means that you're in trouble as a smoker. Uh, and of course, we never, uh, we never delivered the message that uh, it's smoking that matters. Uh, we were always talking about uh, nicotine or other cholinergic agonists. Varenicline was one of our, um, um, uh, one of our proposals together with nicotine with calling with a between some other uh, nicotine cholinergic agonists in a paper that we wrote in um, uh, in august 2020 and uh, again varenicline was examined together with nicotine and three other um, cholinergic agonists uh, in an in silico study so a study using um, molecular 3d modeling of the molecules of the compounds and uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 molecule, basically, the spike protein. And Varenicli was uh, examined in another paper that we, we, we published uh, in December 2020. So uh, they pretended, they didn't understand that, you know, it's not about smoking. It's not even about tobacco harm reduction, let me tell you. They tried to link two different uh, things, of course, because nicotine is the common um, uh, uh, denominator. The common, uh, denominator, yes, in, in, in these doing THR and in, in our COVID research. So they try to link them as if there is some kind of a conspiracy theory of promoting either cigarettes or, um, uh, I don't know, e-cigarettes, heated tobacco products through mm -hmm. our study. Well, uh, we have patented the use of nicotinic cholinergic agonists uh for covid and it has nothing to do with thr we only mention 
medical use of medical products. Yeah, and this is why and I wanted to ask Jenna. Con, let yeah. me ask Jenna a question because Jenna has been in medical publishing for a long time. And she's now in public relations. I mean, she started as a child, obviously. Jenna, my question to you is this. Okay, you're going to have to unmute yourself to answer it. Um, as a publisher of a medical journal and now in doing the work that you do, how do you view what is going on in scientific journals? Because the rest of us, the consumers, and I guess the public as well, we look at these these journals as being, you know, founts of information and facts and science. And obviously from what's, what Khan has gone through and obviously what Asa has gone through, it seems that there's some sort of corruption going on of the actual science. And how... Do you view that and also how do you view we should react to it? Okay, thanks Nancy. As a public relations expert and former publisher of Medical Observer, I think the attacks on THR experts and advocates are below the belt. And um, instead of confronting the issue, the attackers are um, shooting the messenger, which speaks ill of their strategy. In recent months, the attacks on us had been uh, derogatory and sometimes it borders uh, defamation and libel which is a crime in most countries but the question that we have is what do we do and how do we confront yeah. it um number one lesson when we are in this situation is that you're not supposed to be silent hoping that it will go away that's number one number two the second lesson is to be direct straightforward and simple in our response so that people will understand the issue no matter how complex it would be. Third lesson is to learn to distinguish news from opinion. Not all articles that come out in newspapers or news portals are news. Some are opinions and people have the right to their to his or her own opinion. But that's not the case with news. News have to be accurate. And if a newspaper is publishing inaccurate information, readers have the right to call the attention of the editor and the publisher. So they can write an article with their side of the story. And if that news portal or news article values uh, objectivity and fairness, then they would include our side of the story. Number four, clarify, deny, and rectify. Even if the attackers choose to focus on hitting below the belt, we should remain calm and we should present facts to inform and not to insult. In the face of negative uh, news, fake news, or derogatory statements, we should be patient enough to clarify the issue by giving our side of the story and deny inaccurate information and rectify the errors by pointing out what is true. Number five is to respond quickly. If something comes out in the news and it's not accurate, you're not supposed to give your side of the story or rectify it tomorrow or two days from the time it came out. You're preferably and ideally, you're supposed to correct it on the same day. So we have to be ready to tackle news, fake news head on. Number six, I'll try to make this quick. Six is present better stories. When we say a better story, you're supposed to um, give something that's relevant, um, timely, accurate, interesting. And there, these are the elements of news. So to make an interesting story to readers, we must combine sci scientific evidence with the experiences of smokers, vapors, and nicotine users. And then finally, Finally, last one. Um, I want to emphasize that opinions could change. And it may not change as fast as we would want them to be, but they do change. Many years ago, um, it, it took many years for people to stop believing that the earth is flat. 20 years ago, we thought that climate change was a hoax. 10 years ago, we thought that uh, self-driving cars are fiction. And two years ago, no one thought that working from home is feasible. That's all change. And this change should start from consumers, not from righteous self-non-smokers. Well, it's here's time the to thing. 
Yeah. Here's a question, though. I mean, a lot of the things that are in the newspapers, and Constantinos, this might be you as well, a lot of things that these newspapers are picking up, they're coming from these scientific journals and these so-called experts. So how do consumers and the public, how are they able to reliably assess the value and trust what they're reading in the newspaper if the scientific journals are having issues with getting well, the facts. Well, uh, uh, it, it, uh, let me let me let me um, um, now intervene with in, in what uh, Jenna said because these are exactly the problems that I have been facing. All the things that uh, Jenna correctly mentioned that you should do, it's exactly what I was facing. For example, I wanted and I submitted my response to the BMJ for the first time on the day the article was published. And that was my main concern. I have more than 15 email exchanges with the editors. And my main concern was the speed of response. That's what exactly what Jenna said. The, uh, and I was, I was seeing, it was more than obvious, that they were trying to delay my response because my response was ready uh, since January 2021 because that was the third attempt. Uh, let me remind you that <coughs> that the same journalist wrote an article in Le Monde in January and in, uh, in a Dutch uh, medium, medium in, um, uh, again, in January. I mean, it, it was just a few days uh, apart. Uh, so I had everything basically prepar prepared because I had sent three letters to Le Monde, two letters to the Dutch media. No one ever responded. So uh, everything was ready. So uh, one of their tricks was to delay my response and eventually to deny my right to respond. And you know, my response was not just, you know, theories and nonsense. My response provided official documentation provided through a freedom of information request that journalists had a conflict of interest. They were paid by Bloomberg. It doesn't matter if they were paid for this uh, article or not. There, there is no proof what they were paid for, but they had been paid. They didn't declare that. Um, it was just a few days ago that I noticed that the BMJ is a media partner of the investigative desk. So it's not even mentioned in my response, which was published in Chaos. So speed, story, they didn't like the story. They wanted, in my response, they wanted me to remove the reference to the Freedom of Information documents. While they, I, I sent them all the documents in a separate email. I had all the documents online. You know, I was not mm -hmm. uh, referencing to fantasy documents. The documents were released online because they were obtained yeah. through a Freedom of Information request from a university not from an unknown source so you know they wanted they didn't want any of the arguments that you know destroy their story they didn't want it to be up to be online that's the yeah. main point so it's censorship first of all it's defamation with lies and then it's censorship towards your right to respond now so my question that but Khan, here's the question, okay? I mean, is this, a, it seems to me, and maybe I'm out of the loop for too long, but it seems to me that this attack, the attacks, like on you and the attack on Asa, this is like a new method that they're using to try to prevent the facts from getting out. I mean, do you have any idea why that is? I mean, it's, it does... Listen, it, it's, an, it's, an escal it's an escalation, there is no doubt. It's uh, definitely an escalation. Now they're using, you know, the media, no one cares about the media. The stories in the media, they're just, for, you just forget it uh, and that's fine. But it's an escalation because this, this, uh, this rubbish is now in the scientific domain, believe it or yeah. not. Uh, and that's why I was trying to, um, uh, to have my my uh, story in a scientific domain and that's why they didn't want me to have the story in the scientific domain well unlucky f uh, uh, they, they were unlucky because chaos which has my response is also in the scientific domain it has a doi number so um, it can be cited it can be uh, used as a reference um, and it's 
far more um, um, uh, it, it contains far more details than the censorship that BMJ wanted to enforce. Um, uh, and I think that's the only way you can do it. That's the only way. Now, as Jerry said, he sees, and I'm guessing that you probably see the same thing. You can confirm or deny. He sees that this is not. This is just going to get worse, and it's going to be oh, yeah, more definitely. and more of this. Definitely. I mean. Uh, Asa, I would like to ask Asa a question because Asa was attacked in the BMJ as well. Asa, when you were attacked and you went through the process that you had to go through, has that impacted your advocacy in any way, either negative or positive, because of what you went through? Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, thanks, Nancy, and hi to everyone. Just greetings out. Uh, sorry, I can't turn my camera on because it's so shaky, jumpy, I'm on the road. But uh, to respond to that question, definitely it had. And uh, there's a lot of uh, anti, you know, the, our, our opposites, the oppositions uh, had been using that somewhat, uh, somewhat. I don't think they use it much since we started uh, to respond back you know like uh, of course us from ecst from uh, in secret smoke thailand and also from kac and also from inco that uh, were mentioned in in that uh, that researchers quote unquote you know mm -hmm. I, I don't really want to call it research or anything and uh, we were quite surprised that uh, something like that could be in what you call a very respective medical journal you know, it's something like uh, they, they, they printed out like it had been scientifically proven. And in the end, you know, they just have like a line or two saying that, well, after all that been said and done, there they can be, they, the evidence has not been found linking between us and uh, Philip Morris. So I say like, so what what is everything's going on? So... Uh, I don't know, positive, I don't think so, and negative, uh, somewhat, not not a lot, but surprise, yes, you know, like, we, we were shocked. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, Mirza, you're listening to all of this, you're a relatively new advocate. Um, what is your take on the fact that, you know, the experts or the journals can do these kinds of attacks and obviously as you know then the media picks up on it as jenna explained you know and they you have the out outlet via the media to com complain but how do you view this as a relatively new advocate what is your take on all of this uh, well first of all hi everyone <laughs> i basically think it was something we should have expected it was the it was something i expected as a natural progression i remember uh, when i started vaping there used to be attacks on the science behind vaping. And in our country, Dr. Uh, Farsilinos is very well known amongst the vaping community because whenever there was an attack, his articles and his rebuttal was always quoted to uh, allay the fears of all us vapors here. When the science stopped being attacked, it was only natural that they started attacking the advocates and the consumers. Uh, by profession, I'm a lawyer, and I've seen this. This is, I've seen this in courts when you're fighting a particularly difficult case, and you make good points. Sometimes the opposition resorts to personal attacks, something which which, which never flies. And and same here, we might get a few people that uh, that pick up on it, try to use it, but even they know, and the public at large will to an extent know that this is all just smokes and mirrors this this will not fly plus i think i i honestly think we should be more uh, when it happens i'm pretty sure it'll happen to me someday as well i don't plan on sitting by i i will go on the attack there, there's there's so much you can do like jenna said the response comes first like dr farsinos also did the response should be fact-based, not personal. You break holes in their arguments, you break holes in their story, and then you then you force them to apologize. Make them see you're not a soft target. Because they'll keep doing this otherwise. They need to know why 
I, I, I'm sure everyone remembers when, when vaping came out, it was tobacco that attacked vaping. Tobacco is backed off because we, because the consumer advocates and the vapors in general did not let that sit by. They, they were always harsh in their rebuttal. What we are facing right now is, is, is a new wave. A new wave and the, uh, it, I honestly think that uh, it's, it's to be expected and we should be on our guard. Okay, I agree. I agree. I've got a question and I'm not sure which one of you wants to pick it up. But I'm going to read the question. Given that the evidence suggests that at least some conventional media have been compromised by the anti-tobacco harm reduction messaging they publish and are being funded by anti-tobacco harm reduction billionaires, what strategies can consumers use to ensure that their voices and experiences are heard and that their outrage at the blatant and untruthful interference in scientific health and THR consumer affairs? So. I'm not sure who wants to pick this up. Nancy, Jenna? Nancy, I want, uh, first of all, I want to comment something on, on something that uh, uh, Mirza said. Uh, okay. No, uh, it was perfectly unexpected that the scientific domain, so scientific journals, mm -hmm. would be used by journalists with no scientific background for nonsense, for science mispresentation, misinterpretation, and for, uh, for uh, an attempt to use um, uh, such kind of, um, uh, you know, confusion, creating, intentionally creating confusion in order to mispresent uh, science and, um, you know, and use arguments like uh, uh, conflicts coming from their fantasies. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you, you, do, you don't expect a scientific journal to participate uh, to this game. Uh, it was perfectly unexpected. I was expecting, of course, an escalation in the media. And when you turn a scientific journal into uh, uh, a yellow type of newspaper, you know, a junk newspaper, and you don't give the opportunity to respond, you know, this is unprecedented, um, then something is very, very wrong. Something is rotten, you know, or there are a lot of money around. And, you know, Jenna, it's impossible to fight uh, these billions. Uh, imagine someone wanted to start legal action. You know, how many years will it take? How much money uh, will you have to spend? How are you going to uh, fight these um, multi-million or even billion dollar uh, companies? You know, for someone like me, you know, I'm so much uh, funded by the industry that I don't even own a house. I'm, I live in a house on a rent. You know, I, I was telling friends that, guys, I would sell my house to fight them legally, but I don't have a house. I'm on a, I'm on a rent. I cannot yeah. sell a house that, that is on a rent. So <laughs> then they know that they have the power and uh, it's extremely difficult to fight them legally. So what they are doing is, uh, uh, you know, a kind of uh, extortion basically that's what they do and they don't even give you the opportunity to respond you know when you respond you are responsible for the response they were telling me that you know uh, uh, the bmj is liable for anything it publishes well i said <laughs> you you are so you are yeah. liable for what the journalists wrote for uh, hiding yeah. their conflict you actively participate in hiding their conflict so um I'll, I'll need to, um, I, I want to find a journal uh, to publish my response, you know, in a medical journal. It has more than 30 references. It's far more scientific than uh, what, the, um, uh, the, what, what the journalist wrote. Uh, and uh, I'll try to do that. Yeah. Now, let me ask you something really quick, Khan. Um, Des funding necessarily compromise research and I say that because I know a lot of research has been done with pharma money and nobody has a problem with it well to be honest uh, you know what the we tried to find money through pharma we uh, contacted Pfizer I mean I'll be honest and we wanted to do a study on Varenicline you know it's the study that uh, uh, 
was basically uh, reported a few days ago, as I told you, by another U.S. Mm -hmm. pharma company, which was a nasal spray of arenicline. We contacted them. We never, you know, got any funding, but uh, we tried to find money from a funding from uh, for funding um, for sponsoring by by a pharma company, and they are accusing us of uh, uh, having uh, been funded by tobacco or a cigarette yeah. companies. We never got any money, basically, for any of our research. Uh, all our research has been done with no money. And, you know. No one cares from the tobacco or the cigarette uh, uh, um, industry about our study because our study is about medical use of medical products. You can't, you know, in, uh, when someone is sick, you cannot recommend as a physician the use of recreational products. So by definition, we cannot use e-cigarettes, heated tobacco products, or even tobacco cigarettes, you know, to treat mm -hmm. or to prevent COVID. <laughs> you, you understand that? You I know, understand in, that, but in, in I, our patent, we 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 couldn't have included non-pharmaceutical products. We have a patent right now; it's online. Uh, it's now uh, it's now public. It's a patent for all cholinergic agonists. It has nothing to do with tobacco harm reduction, because for medicinal use, you cannot use non-medicinal products. It's that simple, and they yeah. know it. They know it. Yeah, I mean, just and that kind of, yeah. you know, Con, that kind of ties into the whole Bloomberg thing. And I don't know whether it's been disproven or oh, proven yes. Yes. about the whole, you know, getting the um, the approval in the United States for that hail thing. Okay. And that's going to be a medical product. And that's why he's on this mission to, you know, to discredit the consumer market because, you know, he's got an interest in that. Now, in saying that, Jenna, there's a situation in the Philippines. I know you're not really the consumer advocate, but you are involved in all of this. So I do have a question on the Philippines. What is the current legislative legislative situation in the Philippines, and what lessons can consumers learn from what happened in Philippines with consumer advocacy? Um, there was a hearing uh, with the FDA, and that's when we found out that the FDA received funding from uh, the union, uh, from charitable organizations funded by billionaires. Um, what we can learn from it is that the way to handle it is we have to change the narrative. Um, we have to change the narrative because it's time for smokers and vapors to say what is the best for them because after all, they're the key issue here. If they decide to quit, fantastic. If they don't, they have choices. Unfortunately, these choices are being robbed by self-righteous non-smokers, by health organizations, and by charitable institutions funded by billionaires. So a shift in the narrative is necessary, and I think that's what we should do. Um, yeah. Instead of, yeah. No, but I, there's a second part to that. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. How did the expose of what went on with the union and Bloomberg um, and the FDA funding change the mindset of the legislators there in the Philippines? I think it did because the story came out in a series of news articles and um, it really helps to put things into perspective and it really helps public health policies, policy makers to make decisions. So information is power really the more informed people are the better choices they make okay yeah no that makes sense completely con i know that it's scientific research is a very cutthroat and very competitive okay getting funding is it possible that a lot of people are willing to put up with whatever conditions even though we both know there should be no conditions you have a hypothesis you prove or disprove but conditions of funding in order to have it look the way their funder wants it to look? Well, if you look at um, the calls for research that will be funded, uh, look at NIH, FDA, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the, I mean, the vast majority, if not all calls, are about risks coming from a cigarette. So what do you expect? Yeah. I mean, when they're talking about risks, when they're talking about hazards, when they're talking about problems, of, it's obvious that you need to submit a proposal that uh, is looking at problems, is not looking at potential benefits. So, you know, that's how they are um, uh, able to 
basically, you know, it may sound hard, but they are able to manipulate the research agenda. Because when they make a call uh, for proposals that are going to be funded, they always look for the uh, potential harms. They never look and they never care for benefits. And that's how you can easily, you know, drive uh, research, the research agenda, wherever uh, they want. Yeah, but, you know, I, I seem to recall back in the old days when I was actually involved in, as a research administrator. Yeah, you know, they'd make an application for a grant from, say, the American Heart Association or the American Lung Association. And, yeah, they'd have their, we're looking for the risks of this. And in a couple of those cases, I can recall very clearly that what they were looking for, negative, they actually found a positive. Oh, that's, right. That, 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 yeah, that's an outlier. You you know that. There's always yeah. exceptions that verify the rule, basically. So th these are outliers. Of course, it can happen. But how many people you think are willing to do that? You know. Is it because is it because of the funding issue? They they just look for whatever they they pick those risks because that's where they keep their you know their departments of going. Course. And of course, it, it it's a vicious cycle. You need to understand that. Yeah. No, so nothing there's much nothing, has there's nothing there's nothing objective there there is nothing objective of course there are people who are going to find and report something good but you know when you are predisposed that's a, that's confirmation bias you know at, at its best yeah. um, it's it's a confirmation bias that makes you you know subconsciously i'm not saying that this is some kind of a conspiracy theory but you subconsciously uh, create a methodology that will always produce something bad. For example, we've seen repeatedly studies when they have overused e-cigarettes, they have basically uh, caught fire from being yeah. abused. And of course, you're going to find formaldehyde. You know, you may even mm -hmm. faint if you would ever be able to, to inhale something like that. <laughs> I, I tried it myself, you know. I tried myself to vape at 400 degrees Celsius and after after three puffs that I never inhaled in my lung, you know, I kept it in my mouth, yeah. I felt dizzy for half an hour without, you know, inhaling Actually, them. Inhaling I it. was just keeping them in my mouth. Uh, it, it, you know, people who have never touched any cigarette cannot understand what's happening. You know. Well, people, and if people don't want to understand none of the science that they're going to do is going to actually be of any veracity because they're not the methodology is going to be wrong. No, correct? Of course, of course, of course. So, I mean, let let's just what consumers, Jenna, you said consumers need to like Constantino said, they see something they need to respond to it. Asa had an issue; he was attacked. He had help. He respond, you know, responded to it. They found it, this is going to be a constant thing. I think that we're going to be dealing with for the next year or two. So a lot of consumers, this is a good question, a lot of consumers feel like they don't have the skills or the, the toolkit to be able to make those responses. What do you say to those people? I, I would say that it's best to, um, hold, uh, it's best to um, talk to people who are in our advocacy. You can't fight it alone. Um, in shifting the narrative, it's very important that people get together, advocates get together, and they also should be able to have access to THR experts for verification of inaccurate information. And there's a lot of organization that can help them. Um, needless to say, I just want to point out that changing or shifting the narrative is very, very important. So instead of smokers, vapors, and nicotine consumers being demonized, um, the better story is who is preventing the smokers from changing? Another story is who pre who's preventing the tobacco industry from trying to become better and who wants to block less harmful alternatives? So in changing the narrative, we're actually transferring the blame to those who oppose innovation. And I think that's a much, much better story. I mean, and another thing, too, that, that follows on from that is that people need to be able to speak up because I, it was like Clive said this, you know, we are the evidence. Those of us who switched off from one thing to the safer thing, we are the evidence. And they, and like Jerry had said, you know, attacking a, a private citizen, is it, it's ethically incorrect and defamation, so on and so forth. But I think a lot of 
advocates need to understand. They don't need to understand the science and they don't need to be technical. They just need to humanize it. I'm a human being. This is what I've done. Okay. This is my choice. I have a right to make this choice. I am the evidence. I think that's one of the big things that's missing in a lot of the people that are, you know, well, I want this or I want that. Like Jerry said, it's all great to sit there and have a moan on social media, but you actually have to do it in real life and approach the, these politicians and approach these, you know, officials and say, listen, make them listen to you. But it's very, very hard. And, you know, by seeing what Constantinos has gone through and seeing what Ace is going through, you know, some are going to say, well, why bother? But I think Constantinos pretty much has, has nailed it. By, you have to go after it like you did, Jenna. You have to fight them. You cannot let them win. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with you, Nancy. Unfortunately, the narrative is being controlled by self-righteous non-smokers. That's really sad because what they don't put into consideration is the main issue, the smokers themselves. Yeah. So that's, that's quite sad because they don't know what it's like. No, they don't know what it's like. Constantinos, as a medical doctor, okay, and as somebody who vapes, who used to smoke, I presume, because every Greek I've ever known smoked in my family anyway. How do other medical doctors approach you knowing that you now vape instead of smoking? I mean, do medical doctors still look down on it in their personal lives and look down on you because you do this now? We don't have this, um, um, you know, undemocratic fascist-like uh, behaviors here in Greece. Yes, I was, of course, I was a smoker. Uh, of course, that was a bad thing. We never suggest that we are uh, role models uh, through our behavior because we were smoking. We are not even role models because we are vaping. But uh, uh, what uh, this, you know, bad choice of smoking and then the transition to, to vaping uh, uh, gave me was, uh, you know, uh, um, experience about tobacco harm reduction that you would never get unless you um, uh, are a user uh, or you are in need of tobacco harm reduction. So this is a, a precious, precious knowledge and, and experience. So uh, I, I never have a, any issues. Of course, there are smokers who are uh, completely uninformed. And, you know, smokers, you know, people smoking were telling you that this is a bad thing for you, that this <laughs> is bad for you. At yeah. the same time, they are smoking a cigarette. You know, it's crazy, but... Uh, uh, you know, as crazy yeah. as it sounds, it's it's perfectly true. Um, uh, that's the level of misinformation that these people uh, have managed to 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 to, to create uh, in the in the um, uh, in the, in society. And this is harm done to smokers because yeah. it's the misinformation that you know dictates uh, current and future behavior. And when these people are discouraged. Of, uh, from using uh, tobacco harm reduction products, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's a public health disaster. It's bad for their own health. And, you know, uh, organizations like the WHO, um, the CDC, the US CDC, the uh, 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 European um, um, yeah. scientific associations, um, uh, it's their own. Um, you know, achievement, let's call it in quotes. Uh, yeah. That's their achievement. They have managed to um, uh, discourage, actively discourage smokers from using tobacco harm reduction products. And the end result for the vast majority of them is that they keep smoking. They continue to smoke. So yeah. it's harm, you know, it's harm, harm for people. Yeah, I mean, and that kind of goes against the Hippocratic Oath, I would imagine. But I guess some people, you, can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. There are doctors here in New Zealand still that believe that nicotine is carcinogenic. And there are doctors here, I mean, one of our friends just went through it. He, he got bronchitis, and the doctor said it's because you vape. You know, it, 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 it's like willing ignorance, and that kind, that's concerning. It's very, very concerning. Well, the same misconceptions about nicotine exist everywhere. We, we published a study, I think it was 2016, of um, um, Greek healthcare professionals. They had the same misconceptions about nicotine. 60%, 70% of, of, of them said that um, nicotine uh, has an important 
a very important or extremely important role in um, uh, smoking related cancer and cardiovascular disease something like that you know the, mm -hmm. the 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 proportion of them believing that nicotine plays a major role is in smoking related diseases is tremendous and it's not just a society it's also healthcare professionals so you understand the level and the extent of misconceptions and uh, uh, misbeliefs uh, disbelief on on on, on THR. Okay, I've got uh, the last question that I have for all of us is this. How can, should governments assess scientific research? Clearly, they are not following sensible procedures at the moment. I guess this relates to the WHO. When they say something, everybody takes it as, as you know, gospel. So how should governments assess the scientific research that they receive? By doing exactly the opposite of, of what the WHO does. <laughs> open debate with all yeah yeah open debate with all voices um um i would even say including the industry but it doesn't even matter if the industry is included because there are a lot of voices which have been you know um which have remained on the sidelines with voices that are not you know linked to the industry in any way they just don't do it you know it's 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 uh, an amazing job at cherry picking, you know, at using yeah. whatever fits your own agenda. The confirmation bias is unbelievable. And it, you see the confirmation bias there. You just look at the kind of studies that they pretend to ignore. They don't ignore them. They know them perfectly well. They pretend to ignore them. They never use them in their documents they know that they are there they cannot you know dispute that they are there okay bonus question sorry i know i said it was the last one uh, here we it's, go. it's like a panel of myself only so please ask <laughs> the other two i don't want to um, be you know overwhelming all right this one's kind of a scientific one sorry con you're the popular guy tonight um how much damage in terms of lost years of lives has the anti-vape rhetoric and influence cost us since e-cigs were introduced i'm guessing that means how many people you know how many years no, no, of people's no, lives no, no, he, he, the, the question is perfectly fine uh, okay. years of life lost uh, life years lost is a, a, a well-established marker of public health damage that we use in all public health um, um, issues for example with covid uh, the uh, years of life lost from extreme uh, <clears throat> measures such as lockdowns uh, from shutting down schools uh, is going to be uh, much higher than a li uh, the years of life lost is going to be much higher due to the measures than due to COVID. The there are studies already, for example, that school closures in the US will cost over time, of course, more lives of year lost uh, from the society than the number of deaths that were averted because of the school closures, even in the worst case scenario. Nancy, this is something that New Zealand and Australia is going to pay a very heavy toll. And imagine, um, uh, and that's another issue, that um, COVID will never disappear. It's going to be endemic. So um, mm -hmm. the countries that invested in... Um, the disappearance of the virus, uh, I think that they're going to have problems in the future. They will have to remain isolated from the rest of the world, and that's a problem. But, but uh, go going back to going back to tobacco harm reduction, yeah, I cannot give an accurate number, but you know, lives of years, uh, years of life lost means you know, for people who don't know, um, you look at how many people die prematurely and why, and then you can um, uh, find how many, you know, based on how many years you would expect them to live, um, mm -hmm. you can calculate um, number of years that uh, are lost in society from different issues, you know, from suicide, from cardiovascular disease, from smoking, you know. And of course, you can calculate the years of life lost when you prevent a smoker from quitting, you know, by using a less harmful yeah. alternative. So this person is going to die prematurely. They're going to lose years from their lives that they would have gained 
had they switched to, to, to vaping. And you can do modeling and you can find out over time how many years of life uh, are going to be lost. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm sure it's, we're talking about millions. It's definitely millions. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> sorry, it, it's going to be different in different countries. It's not going to be the same for everyone. So you usually uh, calculate them on a country level or on a regional level, you know, for example, Europe, uh, Asia or whatever. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely going to be millions okay. because smoking, we know that it reduces uh, life expectancy by quite a lot. So imagine how many smokers a country has and, uh, you know, over time, you would expect many, if not most of them, to switch to tobacco harm reduction, so um, increase their life expectancy. This is going to be lost because of Bloomberg, WHO, and things like that. So they are responsible for uh, the society losing uh, years of life. That's definitely the case. Okay, fair enough. So they, they've got blood on their hands is what you're saying. No, that, that's exactly what's happening. You know, it's a public health disaster. These are uh, uh, public health uh, enemies. That's exactly the way that they're doing things. And of course, it ends up in, in years of life lost in people dying prematurely. There is no doubt about that. Okay, thanks for that, Khan. Any final thoughts, Asa, that you'd like to present? Yeah, of course, uh, just to kind of like a total up of what uh, others, you know, all of us have been said all along. Uh, one, uh, a lot, a lot of things that Jenna had said really made sense, you know, and uh, I, I think that what we as a consumer should do, because of course we are fighting an uphill battle, that, that's for sure. And, and it's not going to end easily. And as doctor said, you know, it's going to escalate, you know, it, it's, it's not, it is not going to, uh, subside or anything so so that quick, uh, especially in this part of the world. So yes, it's an uphill battle, and uh, we what we have to fight is uh, we have to fight billionaires, billionaires, you know the so-called philanthropists. Uh, that, that's also going to be difficult. But what we can do is uh, some of you have mentioned, you know, some of us had mentioned before earlier today, is that. Uh, well, I think we should stick together, you know, uh, maybe, uh, what was it, Nancy, you said that, uh, why bother, right? I mean, if everyone thinks like, hey, why bother, you know, it's going to be too difficult, then, you know, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Of course, I have, I have thought many times that they say, yeah, why bother? But then again, I look at myself, you know, look at the health I came back from quitting smoking and turn to vaping instead and, and look at my uh, friends and especially my sons, you know, and, and uh, look, look at them and, and they, quit, they quit smoking by, by uh, turning into vaping instead and totally, you know, really finally some of them already quit vaping even, you know, without, without uh, tobacco harm reduction. That would not be possible. They have tried. Yeah, no, I agree. So I, I mean, think, I you know, that, that we should look. Yeah, I mean, people get you Go know ahead. the people that say why why bother. I get very frustrated with them um, because you know mm. those of us that are out there doing this, you know, we're doing it not just we're not doing this for ourselves. You know, I don't think they yeah. realize that. Um, Mirza, any final thoughts from you, darling? Because I know you have to go soon. Uh, no. I don't no. have anything. There's, We've there's just completely thing. blown his brain out. <laughs> Poor <Marissa. laughs> I mean, I've not reached that point yet. Uh, so it's, it's just, I have nothing. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Um, Jenna, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Unmute. <laughs> One last thing that I'd like to say is that I think... Uh, opinions change and I think the critics of THR will eventually change you know why because science is on the side of THR and they won't be able to do anything to stop it fair enough Constantinos last but not least um, we need to be patient 
we need to be um, uh, consistent with our principles, with um, ethics, of course, and uh, we should not succumb to the uh, extortion. That's yeah. my message. Fair enough. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, everybody out there, wherever you are. Um, any comments or questions, just leave it, I guess, on whatever you're watching, and we'll answer them. Thank you, Constantinos. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Mirza. Thank you, Asa. Good night. Good day.